Cuban idea, and I'm going to do that a bit, ground it in Latin America. And then Dario is going to speak about recuperated workplaces throughout Latin America, now in Europe as well, with very specific examples. And then Diego, who is running a little bit late, um, I'm kind of out there here, um, judging, and he's going to speak about local, very local concrete organizing in Brooklyn and in Sunset Park in particular. Um, do you guys mind being filmed? No. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, and you're going to introduce yourself in a second and some of your organizing. And this is Camilo, which is, Dario and I have collaborated on a number of projects and books, and this is our best collaboration, obviously. <laughs> the one. So we're going to kind of pass him around and he's participating. I've been involved, I um, started out with Occupy Wall Street movement. I've been um, involved in neighborhood assemblies and local organizing in Sunset Park um, to defend housing and also Strike Debt, which is an organization I'm sure some of you have um, Arts and Labor. <clears throat> yeah, and I think Marina's idea is really great because, yeah, just the idea, I'm really just in the idea of rupture. I'm not sure if I've that, but it's in her books. Um, yeah, mostly an artist and I've also done political organizing. She's very humble. She's an amazing organizer and participant and, and very humble. Yeah, so we'll start. Okay, so we're each going to speak 15 minutes and really she's going to hold us for this 15 minutes so that we can have a discussion, especially because we're running late. Um, okay, so um, starting out, this whole idea of everyday revolutions is something that's actually borrowed he learned to talk from his parents. <laughs> um, it's something borrowed from the movements in Argentina, um, where they talk about revolution, kind of the everyday revolution, not revolution of everyday life, but everyday revolutions. Um, and if people don't know, just in a nutshell, in Argentina, in 2001, um, a kind of culminated economic crisis brought on a popular rebellion. So in December 19th and 20th, on December 19th and 20th are kind of these days that people refer to as the breaking point, the rupture, um, when people went out in the street uh, because their bank accounts had been frozen, because of increasing privatization, and just had had enough. Um, and they went out, and rather than organizing, as in the past, with political parties um, or with the unions or a different kind of hierarchical forms of organizing, um, people went out just en masse, banging cups and pans, um, and the slogan, or kind of song that came out actually, was the Que se vayan todos, they all must go. And Que se vayan todos, no lo queden ni uno solo, so that not even one remains. Um, and they actually forced out four consecutive governments. Um, and in that moment, and from I lived in Argentina um, after the popular rebellion and compiled an oral history of people talking about their experiences, um, and people again and again talked about how in these moments of forcing out governments of massive popular power, they looked to one another, and there was even a moment where people were being chased by the police, and they described being chased by the police in front of the gate to the pink house, it's the version of our white house, and they kind of jumped, jumped over the fence and looked, and you know, well, what do we do? There aren't so many police here, and there's no military in this moment. Is this something we want? You know, the pink house, quite literally. Um, and this handful of people decided no. But as a whole, the movements also, like the, the taking over of the government house, you know, in that symbolic moment, but then more generally in the movements, was not something that people in the movement saw as the strategy for change. Um, this wasn't a pre-thought strategy, pre-organized, but kind of in that moment, this is not the direction we want to go. Um, and instead, people in neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood formed neighborhood assemblies. Um, looking to one another, and this is where the word horizontalidad, where we talk about horizontalism or horizontal, horizontality, horizontalism is a pretty terrible translation that I apologize for. Because um, it's not an ism, it's a social relationship where people, you know, look to one another and really actively listen and build relationships with each other in this horizontal way. And people are developing that in neighborhoods and then going into workplaces um, or taking back their workplaces with these horizontal relationships as a way of kind of building power with one another. So seeing power not located in the institutions of power, but with, with one another. And from there, building new social relationships, but also finding ways to meet their concrete necessities. So we're still in Argentina in 2001. Um, and then over the years, people took over what are now 350 workplaces, um, running them together horizontally without bosses, using the language of recuperate, something that, that Darkness is going to talk about. Um, and 
and building power. Now, there are a lot of questions that over time um, have come up, in particular in relationship to the state, so that creating this kind of autonomous, horizontal space power relationships, um, but the question of, well, what do you do about formal institutions of power, the state, um, repressive institutions have become more and more of a question, and it's something that um, actually is talked about in the interviews I did later in the book Everyday Revolutions. But for now, just to focus on this, this part of where where the point of reference is with one another. And that's Argentina 2001. Just to ground this a little bit more before we jump to our kind of contemporary movements, um, the Zapatistas in 1994, in Bolivia with the Gobernadora del Agua, um, around in Cochabamba, not looking to take state power, but to create power again. So there are these autonomous communities that are gigantes who control their own water in parts of Bolivia. Um, the Zapatistas, I think, obviously, people know about where we, there are tens of thousands of people you know, running their own societies and autonomous communities. And a lot of this we grounded in the book that Dario and I did, Occupying Language. It's actually more about occupying practice. And we, we ground a lot of this in um, these new experiences now, in the experiences in Latin America, and date kind of a beginning turning point in 1989. So the fall of the Berlin Wall, living in Berlin. Interesting that we're marking this moment. But it is kind of because that, that moment of a kind of vision of how we make change in society and not being any longer about building the party that will then take the state and create the revolution and make change for all of us. Uh, but instead, kind of breaking from that idea and creating the change together with one another. Not seeing capitalism as an answer at all, but saying that the way to make whatever kind of free society, whether you want to call it socialist or communist or anarchist or whatever you want to, whatever free society that doesn't have capitalist value relationships um, isn't going to happen through this, this taking of power and creating another kind of institution. Um, so then I'm kind of doing a big overview. We can talk about all kinds of stuff in the discussion. Um, so when we look at the movements today, and you know, beginning in 2011, less a little bit Tunisia and Egypt, and then more when we think about Spain and Greece and <coughs> Occupy Wall Street and Bosnia more recently and Brazil and in Turkey, the ways people have been organizing really by the millions um, all over the world have been to come out into the street, the similar spirit of the Que se in, in Argentina, with the no, with the we don't want what's being imposed on us, whether that's economic crisis, but it's also a political crisis, it's a cultural crisis, it's, it's many ways of thinking about crisis. It's not just a purely economic kind of relationship. And first saying no, but not organizing with political parties, not organizing to build this other structure that will then replace the old structure, but instead saying no, we want to stop the, you know, the yabasta like the zapatistas, that no, stop, and then open something new in spaces. And this is why I think we see both you know, throughout Latin America and now around the world the importance of these horizontal assemblies. That can sometimes get tedious over time, for sure, where you're hours and hours and hours in these assemblies. But it's about listening to one another and hearing each other and figuring out together you know, what, what we want change to look like. Um, how much time? Maybe seven minutes. OK. Yeah, I still need um, yeah. um, so, um, so thinking about and looking to one another for that change and in those relationships. And then in the concrete, what that looks like as far as concrete necessities and power is making it happen ourselves. So not placing demands on the state. Partly, um, and to a large extent, um, because the state's not responding anymore. State's kind of in plural. It's not just that people are looking to one another and saying, wouldn't it be so much better if we did this autonomously? It's also, you know, there were five general strikes in Greece against austerity. And the Greek government kind of said, oh, well, it, it's not important. Um, ignoring the population and people kind of being forced to organize themselves. And this is fairly consistent around the globe. So people looking to one another to figure out, okay, so, so how do we do this? And you'll talk about workplaces a little bit. Um, one of the ways this has been expanding since the occupations of the large plazas and squares, people have 
In some places, like in the U.S., we were evicted from almost all of our squares and plazas. But in some places in the world, like in Madrid, actually, people talk about them having been repressed and evicted, but they actually decided in a 24-hour assembly, which sounds a bit nightmarish, um, but decided thousands of people together using a pure form of consensus that they were going to leave the plaza. And that actually to create more in a real democracy needed to happen in neighborhoods and in, in workplaces where people had concrete relationships and could build relationships with each other. Um, and so around the world we're seeing in um, Bosnia they're called the plenums that they're organizing. In Turkey there are local assemblies. In Brazil in the neighborhoods there are assemblies. Things that we actually don't hear about in the media or even the alternative media that much. You know, we hear that, oh, everything is finished. The same thing happened in Argentina, actually, when people were no longer, you know, people who looked to be middle class in urban areas gathering on street corners, everyone said, well, the movement's finished. And actually, the movement, you know, how you want to understand movement, I guess, is a question, but kind of relocated, re-territorialized into different areas. So the relationship being very similar, if not the same, of creating horizontal relationships using forms of direct action um, over demands, but in, in different areas. So in the concrete, in this relocating, different places have been organizing around different things. Housing being one of the really big ones, which Diego is hopefully going to talk about as far as the organizing in Brooklyn. Um, we were just in Chicago and all over the U.S. People have been organizing around housing in Spain before the 15M and then after. There's the Plataforma. They have 150 groups now um, organizing around housing. When I say organizing around housing, it's not organizing where they say, okay, let's come together and demand better housing, or demand that we're not evicted. It's not around demands. It's people coming together in these assembly forms and saying, we refuse to be evicted. We refuse to allow our neighbors to be evicted or foreclosed on. So using their bodies to block homes and not allow families to be evicted. Sometimes successfully, sometimes less. Over time now, in some places, people are beginning to take over abandoned houses, abandoned buildings, like in Spain, like in Italy, and other parts of Europe, um, and in Chicago, which is very exciting. Talking to neighbors first, and, then, um, and doing that. So the, so the framework is more of looking to one another, deciding together, and then making that thing happen. So in the, you know, linking that to the everyday revolutions concept versus revolution, it's not the, let's demand this and take over the, whatever housing board, or whatever kind of government institution makes these decisions, but we are going to make the decisions around housing ourselves together. These are all in very early forms. This is not any kind of answer. Um, we're in a very new historic moment, but a very significant, and I said last night, and I do stand by, revolutionary moment, revolutionary epoch, um, but revolutionary in the sense of everyday revolutions. Revolutionary in that it's breaking from former ways of thinking about and acting on revolution. So rather than creating the party, um, looking to one another to figure out, okay, how do we together make this change using forms of direct action over demands? Not, not engaging with institutions of power, because that does happen, and it is happening, whether that's in the workplaces or in housing. People refuse the evictions, and then in so many places, the banks have come forward and said, we'll renegotiate. And then people are willing to renegotiate. It's not that there's zero relationship to power, it's that the starting point is one another, not looking to these institutions of power. Um, and that it's a process, and it's the beginning. So not to say, okay, well, what's the program? How is this going to happen? You know, we have a revolutionary program here from the past. What's your revolutionary program now? This is a very new process, and I think if we look at it as new, and kind of as the Zapatistas talk about the walk, and walking slowly, and questioning as we walk, thinking in these terms about where we are now in this new way of thinking about revolution that is anti-capitalist, that is about creating anti-capitalist values, um, then, then so, so looking at it in that process, I think, helps us in this conversation now. And we have Diego. Sorry, we started. Don't worry. Okay. Um, yeah. So not. Yeah, I'll stop there, and we can kind of putting a lot out there. Um, so I just kind of did an overview ish of everyday revolutions we're doing in Argentina, and then Dad was going to talk about. Yeah, we're going to work this. Yeah, first of all, I think that it's important to see that it's not that 
like all marina now is famous, is totally new. These practices existed before, but the historical moment is maybe that now they're starting to be like a majority. A majority of the practices is like that. While during the last 150 years, it was always some kind of minority currents inside the movement. But today it's clear, like Marina said, the old strategies are not working anymore, uh, so there is something new coming up. One place where, where it comes up is in workplaces. When I talk about liberated workplaces, I don't mean uh, cooperatives, even if they can take the form of cooperatives, but I mean that people take over something that belonged to capitalism. They take it, occupy it, and try either to continue uh, with the production that, that was there before, or in many cases they have to reinvent themselves, the workers, and, and the production. Like to make, um, what is very known is obviously the movement in Argentina that, that Marina mentioned with 350 factories now that have, you know, companies, let's say, because some are not factories, but other kinds of companies. Um, and, and not many people know that there are a few dozen in Uruguay, there are uh, like uh, about 100 in Venezuela, there are some 50, 60 in, in Brazil, and a few in different other um, Latin American countries, as well as a few in, in India and in some other places. And now with the crisis, recently there are two factories in, in France, there are two in Italy, one in Greece, at least one in uh, Turkey, there are at least two in Egypt, and then there are a few also in Tunisia, even if it has been very difficult for us to reach out and try them, we didn't really get more information and direct contact with Egypt and uh, Tunisia, in the Greece and, and France, and uh, are in strong in a close contact with the others. Um, that's also something that it happened over history in every situation. The workers took over their factories, occupied them, and continued production in, on their own. That happened uh, in socialist and communist revolutions. It happened in, in national liberation and independence struggles. It, like in Indonesia, for example, 45 to 47, the whole train network was taken over and organized only by the workers, for example. And same thing with the tea plantation. Um, it happened in Algeria during, the, the, uh, during and after the revolution. It happened in democratic revolutions like in Portugal in, uh, in the early 70s. It happened in, in uh, obviously in the 30s in Spain. And it, it happened in any kind of political crisis always, that workers took over the workplaces and managed them, uh, organized them on their own, and always in assemblies. Like, uh, not because they knew that they did it like that before, but because obviously it's something, let's say, natural, that if you have, you can choose the social relationship you have, the first thing you do, you do is not to elect the boss or something speaking for you, but you do it like in a democratic way with the others. Yeah, you agree. And, um, so, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the difference now is that uh, it, it happened in the 60s and the 70s, always when there is like a political and economic crisis, uh, any kind of crisis it happens. Now the difference is obviously that workers have to take over the places because they're abandoned during the crisis. They close the, the, the companies. It's not like a, a, a moment like during the revolution where you take over because uh, it's working and you want to move forward. Now, but still, uh, it's still not automatic. When you, most of the workers who reside get depressed try to find a new job, etc. So it's very important that we have now these examples of, of several factories in also in Europe, and we had uh, the doors and windows in, in Chicago, where workers didn't give up. And they set an example, and they had a lot of followers. In Greece, after the factory was occupied, Biome, it uh, used to be, uh, it used to produce chemical uh, uh, construction uh, material, like 
industrial glue and things like that. And now, that's, that's another interesting fact, they moved and are uh, producing organic cleaners um, for cleaning, for washing, for all kinds of, of, of cleaners. And, that's, uh, and after they did that, like the national TV station that was closed down, the workers took it over and continued broadcasting on their own for a few months after they were, uh, until they were evicted. It happened with, an, with a newspaper that was closed down. They were all like brutally repressed and evicted. The only one that really survived was is the Viome factory. But nevertheless, it set an example, and now workers are contacting from other factories Viome to see how did you do that. Is there another alternative to just being out of out of the job and get some money for a few months and that's it? Um, and the Viome workers met with Argentine workers before they took over. That's yeah. They, they, all these workers have their inspiration from the struggles in Latin America, especially from Argentina, since they're best known. And uh, and she's also very humble because she raised the money to send the Argentinian workers to Greece when they were discussing what to do with the factory. So Argentinian workers went there, and after discussing what works, because one thing is if we, I mean, we we're not workers, we're academics or activists or whatever. So we can talk the whole day to workers. We won't convince them to take over a factory. They have to talk to other workers that have taken over a factory. That's what, what works. So these workers from Argentina went there, talked to them, and after discussing a few days, the workers in Biome decided to take over the factory and to start producing on their own. Um, similar uh, it is the tea um, packing factory Fralip in close to Marseille in southern France where they, they just belong to Unilever and uh, they closed it down to transfer the whole production to Poland. The workers occupied the factory that's already four years ago they did that and uh, did a few test productions also inspired by Argentina. They hosted the meeting end of January um, of, with the so-called workers economy meeting where set all the factories in Europe met and activists and people from also from Argentina and Brazil came over for the first European meeting and uh, they hosted it in the factory for that they produced mate with the Fralip symbol on the boxes and uh, like mate is the Argentinian herb tea everybody think drinks Interesting thing, their plan, what they want to do, they moved from this industrial tea that uh, Unilever was producing to organic uh, um, tea they're gonna, gonna produce and also based on regionally grown herbs and fruit, nothing imported with a regional distribu distribution. That's the idea. The same thing that's very interesting happens in most of the factories that once the workers can decide what to produce, they move to healthier, organic, whatever production. Not only because they, it's better for the customers, but because obviously it's also better for your own health if you work there in, in the factory. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also obviously some niche where they can survive easier than have to compete with Unilever industrial tea or something, but it works. And the nice thing is that after a really by 1,360 days long struggle, the Fralip workers signed five days ago of their final agreement and Unilever accepted their demands about money and giving them one production line, and etc. So now they are legally taken over the whole factory and will start produce production on the workers' control in the next uh, weeks. There is another factory in France that is, uh, used to be an ice ice cream producer was bought by uh, another ice cream producer that is part of a big investment fund. They only wanted the name and the access to the grocery chains in France, so as soon as they bought it, they closed it down. The workers also occupied it, and uh, they started production in February of organic yogurt and ice cream regionally, re based on regional products, and distributed regionally after also three years of struggle, and they managed to have half of the machines that were in the factory, etc. Very different situation in Italy, where they, uh, both of the factories, one is near Milan, the other one is near Rome, 
the one near Milan used to produce um, the pipes for um, for air condition of cars, mainly BMWs. They were closed down also by after being bought up by an international investor. Their problem is obviously it's not something you can still continue producing or um, sell the BMW as an autonomous factory or something. And there are also not many other customers. And the owner took out the machines. Same thing happened in Rome where they used to be a place where they built and repaired uh, uh, night uh, for trains, like where they live. But most of the train lines have changed now to fast track trains, so they don't have the night cars anymore. So there's one place in Europe where they do that, and that's enough. So you obviously cannot start building autonomous trains or something. So these are places where people had to reinvent their production. Interesting, both places started with recycling, industrial recycling, and have plans for huge industrial recycling. And they have mixed forms, like the both factories uh, are sharing now their place with different kinds of, of autonomous and independent workers that moved in. In one factory in Rome, uh, they even built or, or uh, fixed a place to have uh, students' homes there where students can sleep. They have offices for independent workers, and they in, in Rome, for example, they started like working since they have a carpentry and, and other places. They started doing the interior of boats and have these plans of, of industrial recycling. In Milan, they talk up. They, they have relations now with uh, agricultural cooperatives in southern Italy, in a place where uh, there is a lot of uh, um, exploitation of. of mainly African migrant labor force and they were really attacked as in, in, in the last years when they asked for better working conditions but there are some agriculture cooperatives that all signed agreements to pay fair wages during the, the, um, the harvest etc. So they buy lemon and, and oranges from these cooperatives in Southern Italy and resell them in Milan and also do uh, lemon and, and orange liquor that they sell. They set up markets for used stuff, have a, 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 a bar and a cooking place where people can eat from all the working places around. Same thing they set up in Rome. So they had to reinvent themselves totally because they could both not continue to produce what they, what they did before. Turkey it was a <coughs> factor producing jerseys and, and, and sweaters. They, uh, they also, after a long struggle, they uh, had an agreement with the owner and took half of the production lines and they're now producing high quality sweaters for very low prices for the people. As they say, started setting up shops in neighborhoods where they sell very cheap these, these, uh, these, um, these jerseys. The interesting thing is not only that they moved all to more sustainable and organic production, but they also are connected to movements. And to the, to the different movements that exist in the different places. In Turkey, these workers were part of the Gezi Park movement. In Italy, they both were part of the mobilizations against the story and uh, are together with, with, uh, with different uh, independent and, and, and unemployed and etc. So they started building really strong social relations and recognizing, and I think that's the important difference when we talk about a recuperated workplace and just a cooperative. Even if most of these places turn into cooperatives legally because there's no other legal form to be a collective workplace than a cooperative right now in the law, but they recognize themselves as part of a working force of people, of communities as a whole. They have relationships to the communities. They work with other unemployed workers. They mobilize to defend other factories that are threatened by whatever, closure or, or uh, eviction. So I think that's the big difference to these new social relationships they build and they see themselves as part of the struggle. So keep up, I would say, a certain kind of con conflictivity. Not to give in and say, okay, now we are a cooperative, we're fine, we solve <coughs> everything for us and we work as a cooperative, but it's the thing, that's just one step. And we are part of a whole of a struggle that changes everything. And uh, and to keep up that. So that's the very thing, like how people then start living differently. Obviously, 
uh, they they know each other. They they start integrating their families into like the 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 factory place because now they can bring them there or they open up spaces for community. That's that's very often the case because obviously a company usually has much more space than the poor communities that are around the, the different companies. The poor communities always lack space. Usually they have like social encounters. So many of these companies give their space, organize community activities, integrate communities, start up like uh, Viome is selling uh, its products in different social centers and support groups and has a big assembly where people so very, that are very uh, friendly or like the factory can participate in the assemblies and help like suggesting what the factory should do looks like we're much closer to some kind of socialization than just simply a takeover and forming a new cooperative or something. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Buenos dias. Good morning, everybody. Um, I was trying to blink uh, 10 minutes on my laziness and 20 minutes on the communist newspapers outside they're trying to give you as you're trying to give them. Um, One thing that uh, I was thinking about is, you know, that, that saying that Subcomandante Marco said, what, we are sorry for the inconvenience, but this is revolution. <laughs> my name is Diego Ibanez. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a person, and I'm a, I like, I have good friends, and I, I want to thank everybody for that. Before we begin, I just want to say, just want to put a couple of things. I was thinking about what is revolution in our heads, or what does revolution mean? And I want to know if anybody's heard of, uh, of some of these things. Um, revolution is a struggle to the death between the future and the past. I just want people to keep that in their head. And that's a, and if you know who said that, I don't, I don't know who said that, but I liked it a lot. The other one is by our brother Russell Means, who was a part of the American Indian Movement. Mother Earth has been abused. The powers have been abused. This cannot go on forever. No theory can, no theory can alter that. Simple fact. Mother Earth will retaliate. Retaliate. The whole environment will retaliate, and the abusers will be eliminated. Things come full circle back to where they started, that's revolution. So I just want to put those two things um, out there. There's many quotes about what revolution is, um, and I hope today that in the little time that we have, we could talk about what everyday revolutions look like. Um, before I begin, I also want to say I, want to, I stand upon many giants, as well as everyone here, um, especially um, a lot of our compañeros and compañeras who are you know, still fighting across the world right now um, around land struggles. Um, I want to I wanna thank um, compañeros Mapuches in Chile who are fighting to the death. Our compañeros um, Lakotas in South Dakota, on Red Reservation, who I've personally been able to visit and struggle with. I want to um, also give a shout out and respect to the Mi'kmaq warriors. Um, uh, up in what's known as occupied territory in Canada. Uh, of course, our compañeros Zapatistas and who are mourning right now and also uh, I think in celebration as well in a lot of other ways because of uh, my compañero Galeano. Um, I just want us to, I want us to be very um, thankful I, for me, myself, I, I do stand on, I want to give a shout out to the people that I've actually learned all everything I've learned from, um, including my sister Camila, compañera Laura, my neighbor Juan Carlos, Cynthia, and my friend Dennis, um, and my friend Miguel Angel. Well, unfortunately, we're no longer friends, but I still learn a lot from you. Um, I also want to say it's an honor to be here with Dario and uh, Marina and with Lena and with Baby, of course, um, who I hope to learn a lot from. I, I come from a different perspective. Um, I think with this, the idea was they, they know a lot about the big picture, um, and they know a lot about that. So I hope people were recording that and taking notes. Um, please read their books. Um, it's amazing the amount of things that you could get when you travel. On my end, it's more uh, specifics. So what is everyday revolution? So I have the, I've had the opportunity and the blessings to be part of lots of small struggles. Um, I've been able to be part of uh, local worker struggles, including the Han Krusty worker occupation, as well as campaign that happened a couple years ago, um, which was a, a, a small um, 
food restaurant place that um, the mostly undocumented workers. If you haven't checked out that film, um, there's a film about it now. It's called The Hand That Feeds. I recommend it as a tool to teach yourself, but also to reach out to other people. I've been able to be um, organizing around uh, post-hurricane, um, post-Sandy issues, um, again with a lot of mentoring from people that were able to experience and organize after Hurricane Katrina. That was a big eye-opening for me. My background comes from migrant rights organizing. I was part of the first wave of, if you can't tell, I'm really young, so I was part of like the Dream Act movement. And um, that's why I understood a little bit about a race analysis. Once Occupy Wall Street hit, I understood. I said, wow, this is a different lots of people from different areas. I saw animal rights activists. I saw um, anti-war. You know, I saw uh, prison abolishment. And I said, well, these are things are all connected. And I thought, well, this is more of a class analysis. So I went from a little bit of a race to a class analysis. And I was changing my perspective on things, you know. And then, of course, the hurricane hit. And then I was like, damn. This is a this is a this is a this is a land issue. This is something that's affecting everybody on the big scale as well as the local scale. And then I thought about it and I said, well, what is this? Who is this affecting? You know. And then I thought about it. this is affecting a lot of people, most majority world, worldwide people of color as well as poor people. So for me, that has been my trajectory as um, as far as like going from race analysis to going to to class, you know, to go into like this is about land. So I try to, I try to, I try to base everything, uh, all my lessons and all my understandings back to land, and I encourage everyone else to do that. I had the opportunity to go visit um, um, Zapatista territory um, about seven months ago, six or seven months ago, and um, I'm not gonna lie, it's it's it it kind of fucked with my head, um, and I mean that with all due respect. Um, there was a lot of, there was a lot of, there was a lot of lessons that you can go on. There's books written about it. I mean, everybody here, I'm sure, is, knows, you know, something or not or another um, about the struggle. For me, in particular, I was really there to understand one thing: what was it that the compañeros zapatistas were organizing 20 years before the uprising of 1994? And for me, it took many one-on-ones. Believe me, I had to beg lots of maestros from the zonas and los pueblos to say, compañero, with all humility, I, I know you're busy, but if you could please uh, give me maybe 20 minutes of your time and I will have to ask some questions. Now we're talking about, you know, maestros, teachers, you know, from pueblos, eight hours into the jungle of Chiapas. Now, a little backstory. I actually drove from Brooklyn all the way to southern Mexico <laughs> in a Volvo. <laughs> And it took about five days, and I'm telling you, by the time I got there, I was sick emotionally, mentally, and physically. Um, it took, uh, yeah, it was nonstop five days, and the thing that really helped out was that, you know, along the way, we had, we had a lots of contacts, right? Through Facebook, through email, you just, you know, hey, where can I stay in Houston? Where can I stay in Atlanta? Where can I stay in Monterrey? Where can I stay in San Cristobal or in DF, in Mexico City? Once we got there, they took us into the trucks, so compañeros zapatistas, which we still didn't see their faces, right? So they're covered up, we go into these trucks like little sausages in the back, and we go eight hours into the jungle. And all of us, all the students were separated to different, how you doing? All the students were separated into different, different, um, different pueblos. Um, I was, when we got to our pueblo, our pueblo that I was at was about a pueblo about 40 to 50 families, very, fairly new, about maybe 10 years old. We got there at 1 o'clock in the morning, and still, every single person, whether they're old or young, to the little kids, got into a line and welcomed us all. Buenas noches, compañero. Buenas noches, compañero. Buenas noches, compañero. Buenas noches, little kids. <clears throat> they didn't even speak Spanish, most of them. You know, where I was around there speaking um, Tocolabal. And for me, that was my first experience of what was the power of what they had been organizing for 20 years based on the roots that they had from before and what they call of course caminando preguntando experiences that they had had organizing humility is one thing trust is another when I asked one after another after another of compañeros what was it that you guys were organizing for 20 years to make 1994 possible 
it came to a very clear conclusion for me at least, and this is different for everybody else, that they had been organizing around trust. When you have to go into battle, and I've seen this again in Lakota territory, where they throw down with each other. I've seen this talking to undocumented workers where we've gone into places and it's dangerous. You see this in direct action. When you go into battle, if you don't have trust, you're unsafe. And I know a lot of people around here know exactly you know, how to do, you know, been part of direct action or you've heard about it or you've done it, you've planned it yourself. Um, that has been something that for me has affected me. And like when I said, you know, when I said like it kind of fucked my head up, what I mean is that now I'm thinking about not what I'm going to do tomorrow, but what's the plan 20 years from now. And that's part of creating. You have to have that analysis in creating what we're calling everyday revolutions. One of the analysis that I want to attribute, again, um, Compañera Camila, my sister, um, and Compañera Laura, who were also um, you know, part of building a lot of this analysis, um, we like to call it, um, we like to call it a philosophy of, of el buen vivir. Now, when we mean means a good living, it also exists in other um, indigenous cultures. It's very like ancient. Um, we have our own version of a when we mean, and um, part of that is how do you organize locally, and how do you organize interpersonally with relationships. So I'm going to explain a little bit of a when we mean with the little time I got, and then I hope we can continue on and, and hear some thoughts. First of all, we have to revalue our standard of living. We have to change what our values are in the small scale. What are our values? What is it that we really value? And a lot of people say, well, I just don't got... I hear this all the time. Oh, Diego, how you doing, Diego? I really love the work that's going on. I wish I could plug in. I just, I wish, I just, I just don't know. I don't know how to do it, you know what I'm saying? Or, hey, Diego, you know, I, I just, you know, as soon as this is over, I promise I'm going to, I'm going to do, I'm going to help you out on something. The same thing I hear all the time, it pretty much says, hey, I want to continue and maintain my comfort level and I still want to live revolutionary. That doesn't make sense to me. But actually, probably a year ago, I was probably thinking the same way. I don't think that's possible. That's one. Two is we have to start creating our own mythology. When you're organizing locally, that means that there is already power and mythology and story existing in the communities in which you work in, in which you live in in which you are putting your energy, your heart, and soul. The mythology exists there. One way that we do this in local organizing around displacement in Sunset Park, where I'm currently living and organizing, is in our meetings, we try to put up quotes around the room of people that are in the meeting. So instead of saying, oh, Gandhi said this, or oh, Malcolm X said this, it's like, no, Doña Francisca said this. Doña Lupe said this. And that's part of creating our own mythology. Because, the, because the, the, the legends already exist where you work, where you live. And we have to tap into that. It makes it more realistic. Number three, we have to begin to organize for survival. Now, what does that mean? I noticed something recently. As ever, I lost my job about probably after I left to go to Zapatista territory and didn't tell my job about it. <laughs> when I came back, I was a little uh, I mean, I was shocked because I thought they would understand. <laughs> they didn't understand. They said you were gone for like a month and a half, like we don't know what happened. I noticed that I got, as I got broker and broker, my organizing got better and better. Now, why, why is that? I think a lot of people probably, probably can relate to that in other ways, right? I think for me personally, it was because as I, as I was organizing, it was organizing for survival. It was like, okay, I, I, my best friend now was going to be my neighbor. You know, Doña Edith, because on Thursday she cooks really good lasagna. I know that. I'm not going to buy anything on Thursday. I'm going to eat at Doña, at Doña Edith's house, right? So part of that is we see it in Chicago as well, the anti-eviction campaign, which I hope all of you are able to either look up or go visit them. I think they might be here. They organize around survival. The Chicago anti-eviction campaign, they take over abandoned houses, they fix them up, and they move in homeless, um, houseless people, houseless families. And part of the deal is that then those families have to then do it again for another family. This is organizing for survival. We are going to get to a point where we have to do that regardless. So we might as well get used to it now, right? Part of reevaluating, and I'm going to finish right now, but part of reevaluating our standard of living 
is also understanding that where we work, where we play, and where we heal needs to be local. One thing that we learned about the Compañeros Zapatistas is that everything was very local. And that made them feel safer. That made them feel like they could actually take something and not worry about money, which is where where we are now. Everyone's struggling about money. Everywhere you go, everyone's like, yeah, I got three jobs. I'm sorry I can't come to that meeting. Yet, multiply that by 20, or multiply that in different forms, and you got society where we're at, right? The Compañeros Zapatistas, they were for their political positions, they do not take any money. They tried it, actually. They tried doing reimbursements, and they tried doing like all kinds of little, like, you get some sort of funding or whatever. It doesn't work. When a Compañero Zapatista gets called or gets, gets supported by the community to go and fulfill a political position, the neighbors come and cook for them, for their families. Their neighbors come and take care of their kids. Their neighbors are growing in the, of the milpas, you know, or the coffees or the corn. I think that's very crucial. I think that's very crucial. I also think that when you're talking about land, because that's what we're talking about right now, we're talking about land, whether you're talking about any struggle, you've got to talk about the intersectionality and you realize that right now, the rich and the powerful are drawing their battle lines very clearly. And if you live in New York, you know that very well. If you live in Mexico City, you see it very well. If you're in Brazil getting ready for the World Cup, you see that extra well. So, we are talking about a land struggle. So, as you, as you continue to see the indigenous or First Nations are rising up, and if you were listening last year, um, Deborah Whiteplume, who's a, a great person and a mentor, who said, you know, prophecy says that you know when the first um, and, and when the firstborn or when when a bunch of males become start being born, when a bunch of firstborns are becoming male, I suppose is how it is, in our tribes, we know that that's a sign to prepare for war. And she says, I don't know about you guys, but in all our tribes, it's all males being born right now. And so you see, indeed, you see First Nations rising up around the world. This is a trend, and this is something that's happening because you know I think I think they've heard the drum. I think they've heard the drum that that's coming. So I really, again, just to just to include, I really um, I push and I suggest that everyone here, or uh, if anybody you have, you can influence that the, the right now the the way to organize locally and the way to have everyday revolutions is to what we're calling it when we vivid but always locally, locally. If you live in Brooklyn, you don't need to go play in Manhattan every single weekend. You, you live, your best friends need to be in your neighborhood, they need to be in your workplace, they need to be local. And I wanna end really quick, <coughs> I wanna end really quick with a couple, um, with what Doña Lupe says, she says, paso por paso llegaremos lejos. And it means step by step we will get far. And with Doña Francisca, because she'll kill me if I don't say this, but she says, la vivienda pertenece a los que viven en ella. Um, because she was part of the rent strike on 46th Street and Sunset Park. Um, so she really believes that housing belongs to those who, who live in them. Um, and just to, set, just, to set the, um, just to set another thing about revolution and to conclude that, one of my favorite quotes, as all of you have heard, I'm sure, is by Arundhati Roy. And it goes, our strategy should, not, should be not only to confront empire, but to lay siege to it, to deprive it of oxygen, to shame it, to mock it with our art, with our music, our literature, our stubbornness, our joy, our brilliance, our sheer relentless. And our ability to tell our own stories, stories that are different from the ones we're being brainwashed to believe. The corporate revolution will collapse if we refuse to buy what they are selling, their ideas, their version of history, their wars, their weapons, their notion of inavailability. Remember this, we be many and they be few. They need us more than we need them. Another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Thank you. Yeah, um, I can take a cluster of questions, so we hear a lot of stuff about trust and healing and local versus macro, um, maybe not versus, but in conjunction with, and you know, there's amazing people that I'm friends with here, we have Stefan from Montreal, and Mary's a labor activist, and other people, um, so yeah, take some questions. And she might do this Occupy style, just so you oh, know, yeah. if your hand is up and there's like three yeah. people <laughs> three she perceives as white <laughs> male, she might jogle it around and so don't feel like it's okay.
offended is about balance, right? Is that not speaking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. First, let me just say I apologize for my phone. Uh, my car uh, was towed. Oh. Uh, the conference started, so I was trying to figure out if it was towed or not. Um, anyway, uh, it was it was really a learning experience and an uplifting experience listening to this panel. Um, it's it's really an extraordinary panel. I guess my question is uh, one of them was actually answered. I was going to ask. Um, the first speaker, you know, what happens to the subjectivity of people who become involved in horizontalism once they go, you know, once they occupy the factory or take over a business? I'm a little concerned that the business becomes everything, the transformation of the business becomes everything. But I think actually the last two speakers did, made a number of very helpful suggestions that at least suggest things to me of what might might happen. But if anybody would like to expand upon it, I would I would appreciate it. The other thing is um, a related question. I was wondering how uh, the division of separations, you know, division of labor, and you know what Marx used to call the division of labor, but also separations between male and female, between young and old, between urban and uh, countryside. How those kinds of issues are taken up by um, horizontalists or people who are parts of these communities? We're going to collect some questions. Comments, questions. I mean, I just have a, obviously a whole bunch of questions, especially about I the whole issue that this is. Um, uh, okay, I do believe that human beings, based on my awareness of, of my own needs, my own personal needs, and also just my awareness and study of indigenous people, that human beings really don't want to compete and kill each other. I really, I, that we want to cooperate, that we want to respectfully communicate, that we want to create together. Um, that we want to sort that out. However, that doesn't mean that I think it's natural. I, I don't think these things, ha these things happen. They have to be sustained through actual processes of self-organizing. And I, I wish that Lena would, I've always wanted to talk to somebody from Occupy who's been really active in that and to understand how that, I've had a lot of experience with participatory decision making which has collapsed, um, and I, I just don't think that these revolutions can sustain themselves without palpable structures and the understanding of a, a, horizon, a, a, leadership, a horizontal leadership, which I think is facilitation. And I can't, I keep trying to articulate that in a more art, stronger way. But um, because it's so easy to get caught up in, oh, we're all self-organizing and it's all natural. It, uh, 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 uh. We're not born into those situations. We are socialized into competition, and we, you know all that stuff. And we uh, anyway. So that's the main question. The other thing is, I wonder, are the people Dario that you're talking about and and Marina, are they aware of one another? Are there are there networks? Are there? Is there a process or horizontal press orienting people so that they know about each other? That's that's another question I have. And um, and what kinds of problems have come up? What are the like you talked about um, the the I mean, I, the states and the corporations, the owners, they're. They're going to get the they're going to get the message and what you you talked about that you alluded to that could you talk specifically about how people how the horizontal the, 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 the people who are involved in horizontal are dealing with that I mean what I mean that's another question and the other thing that I wanted to say was. Um, do you do you all know you all from New York know about there was an article in the New York Times, a really good article 
about the organizing going on in Crown Heights. And I, I thought it was an excellent article because it really laid it out and, and brought out the relationship that that the people from Occupy who are quote unquote bleeding into local neighborhoods are really able to do and for people who don't know basically in a nutshell, which Crown Heights is getting very gentrified and people who people of mostly people of color who've lived there a long time are getting kicked out and young, educated, mostly white people are coming in. But the self organizing that's taking place, humbly led by this woman from Occupy, who does not want to say that she's a leader, of course, um, are, are bringing everybody together so that the, the young white kids are saying, we, nobody should have to be evicted, just like you were saying. So anyway, those are, those are my questions. I have several more, but I will stop. Uh, we'll do one more. Thank you so much. Um, in here and then we'll answer them. So, I guess I'm trying to kind of pick your brains about how to think about the issue of what we do in our lives as they're kind of constructed now yeah. that can, can sort of make sense of the kind of everyday revolution way of thinking about things. And, you know, there are, there are people who are clearly in crisis, people who are being evicted, people who are at work. But, you know, for most people, people are kind of, I would say, trapped in, you know, in workplaces and institutions. Um, and how, how do you see people making, making space for the kinds of prefigurative, you know, everyday revolution, every practice that you're talking about? Um, and I'll, just to connect this to, I was also in Zapatista territory a number of years ago, and something that I heard there really has stuck with me. We were in a Caracolla governing center, and you know, it was a sort of you know tour, um, sort of just one sliver of Zapatista territory. And, um, somebody in our group asked, "What can we do back in the U.S.?" to support you, and the answer that we got was fight to democratize the institutions you're a part of. Mm -hmm. And which I thought was a very interesting comment, but, you know, I guess I'm, I'm thinking about um, what you were saying about we have to kind of almost give up our standard of living um, to really be part of a revolutionary movement. And that concept of democratizing the institutions you're a part of says, Stay where you are and try to democratize it. And I'm just wondering, sort of, what your take on it is. Can you actually be part of institutions and be part of the revolutionary movement at the same time? I just want to say that same question was asked when when I was there recently. Like, what can we do? And um, and, and they and you know, what can we do to support? They're like. Make another caracol where you're at. You know what I'm saying? And that was, um, I, I can imagine that their analysis has sort of also developed along the way. I mean, they're very patient people, but I think they're also like getting, losing patience with the rest of the world. Um, but I could be wrong, but I think it's interesting that, that you heard that. And then the same question was asked, and they're just like, you guys gotta do, like, they have cinco caracoles, right? I was in a realidad, and that was asked there, and that they were like, just make your own caracol where you live. That's that's what you have to do. I'll answer your question. Um, I think it was really interesting about housing and yeah, um, our friend Nicole Cardi and lots of other people from Occupy. Um, they're working the Crown Heights Assembly and they're working with you have urban. I forget what that stands for, but they're working. They're working with um, tenant organizers, professional tenant organizers, in a way that's kind of seen as more reformist in Crown Heights. They have like a very strict list of things, but um, it's gotten a lot of press, which is amazing. Like it's gotten press in the New York Times, which matters. We've been organizing in, Occupy, in Sunset Park with rent strikes. People have been organizing for years, like um, Ben Maria, all these people. Um, 
But I guess what I think is interesting is what you're talking about. We're not born into these roles. So like I'm I'm an artist, but like I discovered that like I really liked being around the people in Occupy, and I loved the like effusive energy. And then when I burned out of that, it was amazing to be in Sunset Park, where I've lived for a long time, and be around older activists and to. Kind of what Diego's talking about, like the sense of healing and taking space, where it's like, oh, I don't need to be at rallies all the time, and you know, more feminist or even just more introverted, kind of quiet thing of like, it is exhausting. It is exhausting to go to like a horizontal meeting after you've been working all day, but like we have food there and you can see friends and whatever. And I'm also, I'm a big fan of taking space. Like I've taken like almost a year off, and that really helped me. And um, I forget who was asking about being horizontal and like institutional. Can you be in institutions and be horizontal? I mean, it's difficult. I have a normal job where I'm working in school, and it's like very frustrating, of course, to have a boss. And like, but that's just like the reality. Like, I'm not living, um, I'm not living in a colony or a farm or in Chiapas or in upstate New York. I'm living in New York City with capitalism. And um, but I love, I love everyday revolutions. And I wish we had a photograph of it. But in 2012. In Sunset Park, Diego and a bunch of people from Occupy Sunset Park. Um, Dennis Flores is from there. We had this huge banner that was satin that was like "Huelga de Renta, Rent Strike," and photographs of our friend Noel. So it was like this mixture of activism and like art. That's what was always so amazing with me. for me with Occupy that it was like banners and propaganda and art and little kids um, and music and decorating things. And I, I can't remember who was talking about intergenerational stuff, but so much of what's going on with them. Um, Francisca, this older woman, of like younger people talking to her, and um, people in the coalition Unidad Sunset Park, like, you know, they've been around since like the Cuban Revolution, they've been around since the 70s organizing housing, um, and just leftist forms of power. And like, how do we, as new, you know, I'm in my early 30s, Davis, 20s, like, how do we meet intergenerationally and the respect and the differences? You know, sometimes there's like major differences of like, hey, let's have like an anarchist freestyle and they're more rigid or, you know, vice versa. But I don't think any of it's natural. It's just for me, it's like plugging in where I feel good. And when things feel like they're falling apart, I'm okay with leaving them at this point. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't feel super hard. I find. Um, we should definitely answer more questions. I'd love, Mary, if you want to talk at all about like, Amazing labor organizer here, Mary, in terms of uh, Mary Clinton, in terms of occupying workplaces and all that stuff. I just want, I would, yeah. if I get, I'm going to say a minute about the kind of changing subjectivities piece. And, well, well, you're speaking to it already, and Diego was talking about it. I think that, like, what, you know, figuring out kind of the what part sustains you. So the question of, you know, what divisions and differences, um, who we are, what, um, the, the building trust and care with each other. And whether that's having food and knowing yourself and getting to know your neighbors. I mean, things that can seem really simple or maybe don't seem political, um, but are a part of... I'm getting frustrated with our talking so much. Yeah, I'm going to beat you. Um, can be... Maybe you won't pass the baby all around all the time. Um, but it is kind of part of what, what we're creating. Sorry, I did, I did lose my train of thought for a second there. I'm going to come back in a second, because we maybe first and then not finish that thought. I'll come back to it. I, was, I just really, I wanted to talk about the subjectivity thing as well. Is I do think that part of, part of the everyday revolutions aspect of things is that I do think that we are plagued a little bit by this Spanish, which is really, they speak Portuguese Spanish, which, how do you say it, like Portuguese? Portuñón, okay. Which was really, uh, really endearing, and I and I and I felt I learned I feel like I learned a little bit of Portuguese. But one thing was that they were very clear about that because we were asking them because they said we organize around the family. That's what we organize around. Our 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 model is based is is to include the family. Our 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 audience is the family, right? And we were saying how in in New York, especially in the U.S., because of the way that capitalism has enforced itself in our lives, that the family has been destroyed. The concept of the family has sort of been destroyed. But then we looked around the room and we said, well, wait, hold a minute, wait a minute. We got a lot of family here. You know what I'm saying? There's my uncle, there's my grandma, there's, I mean, they're not by blood maybe, but that's who they are. And so we, we've got to organize around a different version of like an extended family. And I think that that's really important, um, you know, because again, we are, you know, capitalism finds a way, I believe, and all of us know this in order to like, you know, make things in a way that it wants to be, you know, um, and we take it, right? So, you know, the, the, 
the one thing I, I, I like to say a lot is like, yeah, you know, we should abolish, you know, prisons and we should abolish detention centers, but we got to abolish the term activist from our vocabulary. Like, we got to about, like, that, that's, that's like a way to, to like, to, 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 to disempower, what do you, what do, what do you want to call it? Like, um, not, someone will say, oh, you do that because you're an activist, you know what I'm saying? Oh, they, they do that because they're activists. That's how they disengage the community. We are all people here, right? And, and I think the other one is we also got to erase the word empowering other people from that. I don't like that word empowering other people. Who are we to empower other people? The power exists there. And I think that that's something that we got to be really honest about. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, I think a lot of it, a lot of it has to do with power and egos. And I think humility is something that, you know, we have to start small. And I think that's what we're learning in our, and our, and that's why we're talking about locally is because it's really small and humble. And I really do believe that. I think it, um, we're just going to answer um, a few more questions and we'll take more. Um, I think it's, it's, it's important to stress also, I mean, we're stressing more now this, this community, small part, etc. But it's obviously, as we can see with the Zapatistas and with everything else, there's always also still a big picture. Don't forget about that. It's not about a new feel well hippie movement or something. It's about finding the base to create the new society that is the new social relationships and then see how you find the big picture. So that's always together. We should never forget that. It's not about yeah, like having your small cooperative or your little garden and then everything is fine. That's, I think it's, it's important that it, it goes together. And it has been forgotten for a lot of time that, this, that, that there is the, the necessary base of the community and of the small. Has been like, oh no, yeah, form a party, do something, and then uh, when we all vote for the right thing, it's going to be the change. It's there. So I think that's that's very important. I think though, and, and, and don't forget, I mean, communism comes from commune, not from anything else. So that's uh, so the, the Paris Commune, the, that was the original idea of communism, and the only thing that Marx ever described as a different society was communes. It wasn't a state, a government, or something. So even if we go to that history and stick to it, that's the... But um, about the divisions of labor, yes, one thing that is very obvious in, in all these recuperated workplaces is that people start learning from each other, shifting jobs. It's not about the everybody, everybody does everything if he doesn't know how to do it. Obviously, you have still... I mean, but it's that people can learn to do different things. Maybe you don't like something. I mean, you don't have to do it if you don't like, don't, don't want to do it, but you have to have the chance to learn it and do it if you want to. So, um, and it's very important because divisions are the base of capitalism and of bourgeois society. The division between supposed intellectual labor and the, hand, the manual, the division between the supposed political, social, and economic sphere. The division between men and women. These are all the divisions between suppose different whatever ethnic groups, etc. This is all the base of of capitalism of of, of, of the uh, and of the bourgeois society. So we shouldn't repeat that. If we have like a representative system, a union that represents us instead of we being the union, then we repeat this division of labor. There is like. The one do politics and represent, or the activists are the one doing, the, and the others do something else or do the social part. No, it has to be together. That's the thing. And that's the threat. That's what. That's what really uh, capitalism is afraid of. That you like start tearing down these barriers. And not just capitalism. I mean, many, many academics are afraid of that. Even many leftists. I mean, I've been living in Venezuela for a long time, and it was funny, like how. The ones that used to be leftist economics before Chavez, then suddenly when the communities were self-organizing and speaking for themselves and didn't need the economics anymore to speak for them, they turned to the right. Because like they had made a living of speaking for the poor. So now the poor didn't need them anymore to speak for them. And then they suddenly turned to the right. And so I think that's important. Why is it important with these communal forms? Let's make just an example. In, in Venezuela, for example, they started setting up like uh, community organized distribution of cooking gas. Yeah? If I have, if, if, if it's the community distributing in the community the cooking gas, like if a, a woman with children doesn't have the money to buy it, they will always find a solution. And they do. Like in all the communities I know where they distribute their cooking gas, like 
uh, women with children that don't have a job or whatever, get it for free. And the rest of the community makes up for it. If this is organized by a private company or by the state, they will just have the list who pays and who doesn't pay. And they will just act automatically that who doesn't pay doesn't get any gas and that's it. So that's it. the same thing for whatever, electricity, closing down or evictions or whatever. If it's the community has to decide who gets evicted or not or because it's not able to pay for the electricity, you will always find a solution. Yes. I think we're going to... Do we end at 11.40? Uh, 11.55. 11.50, the next one starts or 11.50 we end? I think 12 o'clock we end at uh, Okay, so we have 20 minutes, is that right? Sorry, our, our timekeeper. Um, okay, so we should have discussion. I'm just going to say something really, really, really short. Um, just about how I think we sometimes don't even notice, like when we're thinking about, well, what do we do? I think we sometimes don't even notice what's already happening around us. So, I mean, I, my older sister, my parents are here, and my older sister, um, before she be married, has had five children um, and had a lot of trouble with childcare. And I remember her talking about how with friends and neighbors, they would sometimes help each other out so that they could do childcare. And it was something she just described to me at one point, and it didn't occur to her as something, you know, political. But when we think about all of these things in our lives and the people we know, how we are related with one another, kind of helping one another, creating different kinds of relationships that are part of your neighbor making lasagna. You know, thinking together about all these little things that are actually pieces of creating new ways of thinking and being and relating. So they might be really little, but if you think about your life and you think about people you know, you will find those little spaces, and it's thinking about how we also develop these spaces, not as the alternative, but that they're there. It's not that there's nothing happening in our lives, and so how do we begin to organize, but that there are spaces um, in our lives, in our workplace, in our neighbors, with our neighbors. I'm kind of thinking from there, too. So, people, there are more comments. Okay, one, two, three. Uh, my question is to you, it's about um, the standard of living uh, question uh, and organizing for survival. You seem to be uh, saying that there was a contradiction between a uh, standard of living and the revolution of everyday life. And my question is, um, you know, as we are revolutionizing everyday life, whether it is uh, in our food or our health care or our caring for each other. It seems like we are vastly improving um, on the corporate version, whether it, it's non-toxic food and health care or caring for each other in a less institutional way. Or Anyway, it seems to me that this is far superior uh, in terms of standard of living um, to the one that's being offered by capitalism. So. Is it not helpful to think of us as raising the standard of living uh, instead of lowering it? Uh, and that there is no contradiction. In fact, part of the creating of the revolution is in fact vastly improving all of our relations and all of our consumption uh, such that, I mean, I just sometimes think that if when we say revolu everyday revolution, that sometimes people think that you're going to be sacrificing a material and spiritual life, and you're absolutely doing the opposite if it's a genuinely revolutionary. Uh, I just wondered whether you, I misunderstood what you were saying. You said like somebody comes up to you and says, well, I want to, I want to, uh, my standard of living, and I also want to be involved in the revolution. You made it sound like it was a contradiction. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's it. What's your name? Melissa. Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Um, yeah, I think I think the one mistake that that comes when when I think I, I say this is that people think people think that when I talk about standard of living that I'm talking about we have to lower our standard of living, and that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that we have to redefine what wealthy looks like. What does it look like to live wealthy? And I look and I, when I was thinking about this, I was like in my apartment. I live in Brooklyn, I'm in some park. I got rats, whatever. Not really because I got a cat now. But, <laughs> But you know, like, I'm thinking about it, it's not big, it's not small, I got some food in the fridge, and you know, and I was like, you know what, I'm pretty fucking wealthy. I'm wealthy right now. And so, I think that it, it goes, it goes by saying, what, what does wealth entail? In this society, we think of wealth, it's already defined for us, right? So, 
So yeah, I don't think that people necessarily, I think certainly there's a lot of people that probably, you know, in what we're talking about, probably need to like lower their standards of living and be less comfortable than what they're used to. However, I think a majority of the way is like, be okay with what you got. Be okay with not necessarily going to strive to get the newest iPhone every single time, which I, I think, I hope most people are, you know, I assume most people are not like this, right? Yeah, and be okay with, be okay with, you know, taking secondary clothes from like, you know, your neighbors that are, let them know if you're looking for clothes, they'll give you some clothes, that's great, you know? And I think this is, this is sort of the suggestion, is that I think we do fall, by default, we fall into the roles that society, I think it was talking earlier, the roles that society, you know, plays out for you, right? And that's like an overall pattern. If you want to change the world, here's this book, you know, here's how to change the world. You know what I'm saying? It's a create the 501c3 and then, you know, get on with it, you know? It's all been written for us. It's all been written for us. And so I think that, I think part of it is, again, redefining what wealthy looks like. And I'm not gonna lie, like, for me, like, different value, like, I wish wealthy, I wish wealthy for me was, I wish I would prioritize, like, eating organic or something, but right now I'm not there. For me, like, for me, for, for example, especially after coming back from southern Mexico and all that, like, the first thing I did was throw away my, uh, my microwave. I was like, this is going out. I'm gone because I want to. I want to. Uh, I want to value going slower. I want to value warming something in the in the stove, for example. You know. And about three years ago, I got rid of my TV. I was like, you know, I have a lot of friends that that's like the pride and joy. Like, this is my TV. Come inside. Look how big it is. And and I and that was hard for me, you know. But you know, I think I think again. I think it really is about just accepting. And I think there's multiple philosophies and I think it's not just, you know, oh, I'm just going to be poor for the rest of my life. But, like, poor is kind of rich. You know what I'm saying? In a lot of ways, the ways, the way that we live in, simple is rich. Simple is rich. That's what I should say. So, thank you for clarifying that. Just one, one sentence. I think it's not about sacrifice. I mean, you will notice that you don't need it. I mean, yeah, who yeah, has yeah. been part of the occupations in Occupy Wall Street? I mean, the people that, yeah. While you were in the plaza, did you miss your CDs? Do you have at home? No, you didn't. I mean, but one, when you're not in the plaza, you might miss them. You might think yeah, you need them. Yeah, yeah. But once you're in the plaza, you don't miss them. So, who has ever been part of an occupation of a... I mean, I've been occupying every kind of thing for like 10 years in a squad, and I've been occupying universities and all kinds of things and schools and etc. And once you're there with the others, you don't miss your whatever CDs or your two pairs of sneakers or whatever because you realize that what you what you really need to need is the social interaction to be with the others. I mean yes you need to eat and things like that but it's not that you need all these material things you think you need when you're not in social interaction with others and in collectivity and everybody can experience that so it's not about that oh you have to mar be a martyr and sacrifice yourself and throw away everything and then feel bad and try to feel like, I don't know, sleep on a nail bed or something, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 think, uh, um, yeah, I wanted to make a couple of comments uh, or general observations. Uh, the first one, uh, it's about uh, this term of El Buen uh, uh, That's really what you're talking about when you say reevaluating the, the, uh, the standard of living. It's not what shows in the commercials, for sure. No, and so you know that that's that that's a very important thing. It's prioritizing. Um, and uh, another thing I want to say is about uh, you know I recently read a, a, a little blurb on on the change in the Zapatistas, like when Ante Marcos died and now Galeano and all that. And what impressed me was that, uh, uh, and then you saw it there that. It's a self-reliant community. It's an autonomous community. It's really, uh, it's a new way of life, and the new way of life implies that they're self-sufficient. And when they say, "Well, build your caracol wherever you are," they they mean you have to be self-sufficient, and that ties in really well with what you were saying in terms of people trapped in traditional workplaces. You know, you spend most of your time working for someone else. And this is where it comes, all the things that, what can you do locally to start building, you know, autonomous economic activity? Because everybody needs uh, food, shelter, they need money. You know, 
there are people in, in certain areas, in certain communities that have a, that even actually have their own currency. Even in this country, you can have your own currency. Uh, and so, and that's very important. You know, it's not just going to marches and stuff. It's building up from you know, from, you know, from the bottom up, building a different uh, economic environment. But it's not just economic. It's a when vivir. So a very important part of when vivir is that hey, I need to survive. So I need to provide for, or we need to provide for ourselves in our local community. And uh, it, it, well, that, enough for that. Then I'm, I wanted to say something about the activist. Uh, and I, I really like the yeah, comment on the term of activism. And this is just what they call, you know. Uh, the same way that they have division of labor, they have division, well, division of labor means that all the activities are compartmentalized, and then you have the psychologist, and then the activist, the politician, the whatever, no? Uh, and that's not when we read again, you know, when we read is that everything is back together, you know? And so, but it's not happening now, you know? And we're here, and then we're trying to do something. And so there is some role that people play in trying to uh, facilitate or catalyze this type of new activity, like what you do. Um, so, but it has different characteristics as, as a traditional term activist. It's more like uh, you know, some people said facilitation, right? Uh, I, I was, uh, I, um, I watched this this dissertation by. Uh, Brown University professor, uh, she's uh, actually a digital historian or whatever. You know, Joe Gould is her name. It's really good. And, and a part of it, it talks about activists, you know, or, uh, in Africa or somewhere. And, and uh, actually in Asia. And, and then it talks about, well, what, what the characteristics of an activist are in terms of the, and And the principal one is self-effacement, which is the anti-leader. So you don't want to be a leader. You want to push, you know, you want to highlight the community, you know? And that's very important because you go there and then you meet, oh yeah, you're the leader, and then, and then, and then, and then Marco said something like that. He said, well, uh, I've been, you know, we've been, we've been trapped in this situation where suddenly Marcos was the leader and it, at some point it served marketing purpose, right? To, you know, publicize, yeah. To, 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 to spread the word. But now that we have autonomous community, we don't need a leader. So basically, it's, uh, the objective of an activist is to self-destruct. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Those are great points. We have, any, we have about eight minutes left, so we should wrap things up and try to get some questions. I pulled up somebody with you. Sorry. The third person was, you were the third person. Actually, just, uh, the, she asked one of her questions that I don't know that got answered about um, decision making and, and like in some of these re recuperated workplaces, like how is that? You know, what are some of the processes that you guys have seen that, that seem to be really working, that, that are sustainable, that that don't you know consume too much resource and time, but but are democratic, etc. I thought you would add something to that effect, and I didn't know if we had touched on that. No. So I just wanted to re-raise that one. Um, yeah, so my question was like, is these uh, workplaces or these factories that are being like seized by the workers, they still like, after that's done, have to participate in a capitalist market economy? And since they're, uh, since they're less exploitative, how can they uh, compete with these other capitalist uh, companies that don't necessarily, don't care about like the communities? Can I jump in on this one? Yeah. Just before he starts yeah. that. I mean, there's two things. I mean, with the recuperated workplaces, over time, I think they're a really good example in thinking about horizontal structures and decision making and participatory decision making. Because when we talk about the movements, too often, I feel, um, the new movements now, people think it means 100% consensus, like what they did in Plaza del Sol, talking for 24 hours about whether or not they were going to stay in the plaza. And there's this conflation of pure consensus and um, democracy or horizontal decision making, and that's not true at all, it's just each space decides for itself, and it's a whole conversation how it kind of evolved in some of the Occupy spaces that everyone used pure consensus, um, but in the workplaces, it's because it's so concrete, I think is part of why they've developed, they continue to all consider themselves horizontal, at least in Argentina, but I think in Europe as well, um, but they have all kinds of different ways of making decisions. 
together. And sometimes they have, you know, Zanon is a really large one that's kind of well known in the south of Argentina. And they have different work commissions, and each one is fairly autonomous in the decisions they make, but then they have their twice a month assembly of the hundreds of workers, and they share what they've been doing and kind of check in with each other. So it's not that all workers get together all the time making all decisions about production, um, but that they all feel that they're participating, and especially participating in those areas that affect them more or where they have more knowledge. So there's a lot we can actually learn from some of these workplaces. And to clarify, the has said it, but the workplaces range. There's like the whole new wave of workplaces, the dozens um, in Argentina, that just happened, are restaurants. So there's restaurants, there's health clinics. And that's why they use the language workplace, not factory, because they're not, you know, there's a hotel, there's all kinds of um, workplaces. And then as far as um, kind of capitalism, and I think I'll probably talk about this too, but it's, you know, yes, within capitalism, but the values that are being created and how they make decisions are kind of experimenting with a value system outside the capitalist sphere. So, for example, um, making decisions, if they're going to, if workers are going to go, um, <laughs> if workers are going to, um, if they're going to release workers from one workplace to go and defend another one under threat of eviction, so Bowen is under threat of eviction, the hotel in Argentina. So each workplace has to decide, okay, we're going to release certain workers to go defend this other place, but we have to keep up production. So they make a collective decision. You know, this is a very different way than a capitalist corporation would work. So it's thinking differently about production and the system of values they're creating. So not just the solidarity with each other, but production-related um, decisions that are, you know, it's experimenting with a different way of being. It's still within capitalism, but it's creating this kind of alternative value system that I think is so important. All these things we're talking about are, you know, we are against capitalism and trying to move beyond capitalism, but it's still within capitalism. So it is kind of tricky. I think the workplaces, though, are great spaces to look at some of these um, can I really quickly just say about the, the just a clear example how they actually compete is like for example I work with co-ops in the Rockaways after the hurricane. Um, if everyone wants to check that out, it's um it's I mean it's part of the, we work with the working world. Um, Occupy <coughs> sort of formed this new group called uh, Works, um, worker owned Rockaway cooperatives, um, W O R C S, and um, we've we've been working this since the hurricane to, to start co-ops. We've, we've already helped start two, a construction co-op and a bakery. And I'm currently working on the taxi co-op um, right now that has six members. Um, and there's like three other, like it's, it's insane how like it's catching on. And it's really hard. Um, this is my first time working with cooperatives. Um, and one of the things is that how do you compete, right? I think honestly like it's, it, it's hard, but Part of the values, part of like you have lots of advantages as a cooperative. One, you're not getting fucked over by some some owner, right? So there's a lot of like you can actually sometimes, many times, actually provide cheaper than other places. It depends on what the industry is. Um, the other thing is is also your local, right? Is that like you know, for example, in the construction co-op, which is called Roca Mia, um, they they live all they all live in the Rockaways. So it's like their neighbors and their neighbors and then this guy and then, so they they don't even I mean. You don't need to be. You don't need to like go. You don't need to go beyond. You don't need to put too much money in like advertising and all that stuff, right? Um, and of course, the protection I think is the other one. Is like your, your community's got your back, and there's a lot of history. There's a lot of history in like Argentina, so that where the community will come and protect the workers from being evicted. Um, but yeah, just as clear, just a concrete current example is in Morocco. Is that's currently what's happening, and that's always a question: How are we going to compete? How are we going to compete? Um, and I think we're finding it at, like. Theoretically, it actually seems like, wow, how are we going to do this? But when you practice it, you, you start seeing a lot of the advantage, advantages in cooperative models, which I think will multiply themselves as they go on. I think it's important always to keep in mind that uh, we, we will not be able to create like the happy paradise in capitalism. So it's, can we point beyond capitalism with our practices? That's the important thing. But we will not be able to be non, totally non-capitalist in capitalism. So that's also why it's always important to keep up the conflictivity with the system. Because it, 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 it will also not allow you to build autonomy and to be happy inside capitalism. It will crush you the moment you get too big and too big and those are a threat to the system. So that's why we have to build the new thing but be always in conflict with the system and fight it and struggle and etc. Uh, is there a form? Well, yeah, a lot of these councils, work groups, or factories, etc., work in work groups. So you have certain commissions that start thinking about things and then they make the proposals for the assembly, and the whole assembly decides 
after they explain it. So it's not that everybody has to be working on everything and deciding on everything, because that would be like you taking uh, more time spending in, in assemblies than, than in doing anything else. Is there a certain form? No, it's different everywhere. I mean, I've been working, like, for example, in communal councils in Venezuela in former middle class areas where they still have a middle class living model, even if the economic situation is not like that, and in really poor barrios neighborhoods, like in, up in the hills. You can have the same assembly, but if it's in a poor neighborhood, if 25 people participate, the next day 300 know what has been discussed there, yeah. because their form of communication is totally different from the living form that they have in this middle, former middle class area where they live like we do in apartments, close the door, nobody knows what happened. So if 30 people went to an assembly, the next day 25 know what happened there because five just went because they were low. So, they, so every form has to create, like you have to create different forms. Democracy means different things, different forms in different places. Simón Rodríguez, the teacher of Bolívar, said, o inventamos o erramos. So either we invent or we will make a mistake. So that's, that's I think, the, the advice, and, and, and that's how democracy is different in every place. Thank you. We have to close. Do you want to briefly say some comments or questions? I had a question, but if you had to close, that's fine. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much. So we're closing. We'll be around for a little They cannot represent us. Uh, it's about direct democracy, etc. And we've been working with uh, movements in the US, in Greece, in Spain, Argentina, and Venezuela. And that's the book launch will be at uh, 310. I don't know where, but we'll find it. Free wine. Free wine. Free wine. And we won't be talking that much, just a little bit. We hope that many people we interviewed will be there. And then it's just like open space for talking and, 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 and Oh, today? Yeah, today, yeah.